Good morning, church family. What a joy I have and a unique pleasure and privilege to introduce to you our guest preacher this morning, Dr. Jarvis Williams. Dr. Williams is the Associate Professor of New Testament Interpretation at Southern Seminary, where he has taught since 2013. He's a native Kentuckian, he's a graduate of Boyce College, and then Southern Seminary with his MDiv and PhD. He's an accomplished teacher, accomplished writer, scholar. He has two recent commentaries, one on the book of Galatians, another on the book of Romans about a year ago. If you were here last week, I mentioned this book, Redemptive Kingdom Diversity, that was published a year ago, A Biblical Theology of the People of God. I read this and was tremendously encouraged by it. It is a biblically saturated word that is pastorally sensitive to topics like race and racism and ethnicity. It's a live conversation, certainly, and it's a conversation that we need the light of the gospel to shine clearly on. And I'm grateful for servants of God like Dr. Williams who address these from the Word of God, but do it in such a way that they don't offer, and he hasn't offered a one-size-fits-all solution to what we know to be complex topics. And so I'm grateful that he is here with us. He's the husband of Anna. He is the father of Jaden. He is also in his free time, which is not a lot here, but he's also the preaching pastor at his church, uh, Sojourn, which is there in Midtown Louisville. And so, as you can see, he's got plenty on his plate. And that's why we are privileged that he's taken the time to be with us. He is going to be here and preaching today. And he has already preached in two services. And then we have a, a luncheon after this. And so, Dawson, will you join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Williams as he opens God's word to us? Thank you. If you have a Bible this morning, turn with me, please, to John chapter 3, verse 16. John 3, verse 16. And as you're turning there, let me say uh, thank you to Pastor David for the kind invitation to be here to preach God's Word. It is indeed an honor and a privilege uh, for which I'm very, very thankful. John 3, verse 16. I want to focus my sermon on the topic of God's love for the world, the foundation to redemptive kingdom diversity. Hear the word of God from John 3.16, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version or the, the ESV. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have eternal life. Let's ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, we pray that you would come now in this place by the power of your spirit and that you would begin stirring up our affections and our emotions and our passions for your vision to redeem some from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation, and help us to begin thinking about ways that we can practically live this out in the power of the Spirit in our normal rhythms of life. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. In my book, Redemptive Kingdom Diversity, a biblical theology of the people of God, I survey the important theme of the people of God from Genesis to Revelation. As I say in the book, my focus is on the creation and transformation of the people of God and on the redemptive kingdom diversity of the people of God. As you know, the word diversity is cute and popular these days, but let me articulate what I mean by that. It's vastly different from what you hear in contemporary society. By redemptive kingdom diversity, I mean God's holistic vision to redeem the entire creation through Jesus' death for the sins of ethnically diverse Jews and Gentiles. 
and through his victorious resurrection from the dead. God accomplished this redemption in Christ with an eye toward the transformation of ethnically diverse sinners scattered throughout the world and with an eye toward the renewal of the entire creation. A creation that is, along with humanity, awaiting the redemption and along with humanity is enslaved to sin and his power. So God in Christ intervened in order to deliver sinners and creation from sin's power. More to the point, in my book, Redemptive Kingdom Diversity, this phrase refers to God's work in Christ to crush the seed of the serpent, Genesis 3.15, namely the, de- the devil, by means of the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, so that ethnically diverse tongues and tribes and peoples and nations scattered throughout the world would live in a transformed way as the redeemed people of God in this present evil age as spirit-empowered followers of Christ who walk in step with the Spirit as we love one another and all of our neighbors as ourselves. This morning, I want to focus on a foundational element to redemptive kingdom diversity from John 3.16. God's love in giving His beloved Son to the world so that every tongue and tribe and people and nation that believe in the Son would not perish, but would have eternal life. And as a result of that life, we would then love one another and our neighbors as ourselves in the power of the Spirit. To state it another way, God's vision has always been to redeem some from every tongue and tribe and people and nation through the blood of His Son, Jesus, and through the blood of His Son who also rose from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that He would create a new people out of many people who were marked off as the people of God by faith, by the Spirit, and by their devotion to Jesus Christ, God's eternal Son. So two truths this morning from this verse. Number one, God loves the world. And number two, everyone who believes in the Son will not perish, but will receive eternal life. First, God loves the world. Notice again verse 16. John says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son to the world. I hope this verse encourages you this morning. Think about the the power of this verse. That God, the creator of the world, the creator of the universe, loves the world. Even when the world rebelled against him, God loves the world. As you know, this verse occurs in a story in John chapter 3 between Jesus and Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and he confesses to Jesus that he and his contemporaries understand that Jesus must be from God. Otherwise, he would not be able to do the things that he did. And Jesus responds by saying, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must have a conversion experience or else you will not inherit the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is confused. He thinks Jesus is talking about physical birth, but Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. And Jesus says to Nicodemus that you must be born of of water and the Spirit, just like Ezekiel says that there's a day coming, Nicodemus, when, when God will transform the hearts of His people, when God will resurrect 
his people from the dead and put his spirit within them and sprinkle them, Ezekiel 36 and 37, with clean water. Nicodemus, that day is now and you must come to me believing that I have come to bring eternal life or else you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then verse 16 comes along and says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so also must the Son of Man be lifted up because, verse 16, this is how God loves the world. Did you notice that in verse 16, how God loves the world? He loves the world, look at it again, verse 16, by giving his Son. Certainly love has all sorts of emotions and affections attached to it. I am a diehard Auburn football fan. Just joking, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a Kentuckian. I'm a diehard UK basketball fan. And when I walk into Rupp Arena, our stadium, I am moved because of my love for the Wildcats, the greatest college basketball team in the history of college basketball. I am moved in ways that I cannot explain. I see those banners. I think about the tradition. I have memories of me sitting on the floor in Eastern Kentucky with my grandfather and listening to a famous broadcaster who's now dead, Kay Wood Lefford, calling those UK basketball games. And in those moments, I'm overwhelmed because of, the, of my love for the Wildcats. So certainly love moves us emotionally. It compels us stirs up our affections. But notice in John 3, 16, that that's not how John defines love here. That God demonstrated his love for us in that he gave us a gift. He gave, verse 16, his son. He offered his son, in other words, yes, to live a perfect life, yes, to teach and to preach, but ultimately to die on the cross for our sins, to absorb the wrath of God for our sins, to strip the devil and sin and death and all the principalities and powers of the air of their power so that we, brothers and sisters, who believe would have eternal life. God revealed his love by the giving of his son. Now, I don't preach for amens, but that's a good place for an amen. We know from the Gospel of John that Jesus came into the world to die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In fact, this is one of John's fundamental themes in his Gospel, that Jesus is the sacrificial Lamb, that that the lambs of the Old Testament, the Passover Lamb in the Old Testament, finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is dying as God's gift to the world, as God's sacrificial offering for the world in order to provide salvation for those in the world who believe. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But but listen to these words. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Brothers and sisters, God loves the world. And this is, it's good news. But a question we must ask ourselves this morning and answer from the text, to whom does the word world refer, right? It's a very important question. It's an explosive question. To whom does John refer when he says God gave his son to the world? The Gospel of John uses the term world in multiple ways. 
But here I think he uses the term to refer to diverse tongues and tribes and peoples and nations. Another way to think of it is this. John uses the term world here to refer to what we would mean by ethnic groups or ethnicities. In John's language, it would be tongues and different tribes and different peoples and different nations. Let me give you two reasons to support this interpretation and to argue for why I think this is on the right track. Number one, In John chapter 12, after Jesus triumphantly enters Jerusalem, John tells us a large crowd was there because they heard about the miracles that Jesus was doing throughout his ministry. And one of those miracles was he raised Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. The Pharisees are there, and in Jerusalem, They became anxious about the large following that Jesus had gained because of his miracles. And they lament a complaint with these words to one another in Jerusalem in John chapter 12, verse 19. You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now John can't mean here by world... Every single person without exception has gone after him because the Pharisees are not going after him, right? That's not a rhetorical question, right? It's okay to talk back to the preacher this morning, folks, right? You have numerous examples in the Gospel of John where more than one person rejected Jesus. Just go read John chapter 5 and 6, for example. But when John talks about the word world in this particular verse, when these Pharisees speak this word, he, he means non-Jews are going to follow after him. He mean, they mean, the Pharisees mean, that they're, they're anxious because Jesus' mission is not only impacting Jews. In fact, that's one of the points of the Gospel of John. It impacts everybody who believes that, that his mission and his ministry includes every tongue, every tribe, every people, every nation, Jews as well as Gentiles. Brothers and sisters, the Pharisees are anxious because they realize that Jesus' movement is about to explode throughout the nations. So immediately thereafter... They make these remarks. Listen to what John says in John chapter 12, verses 20 and 21, when some Greeks come to meet with Jesus. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. And they came to Philip and they said, Sir, we wish to be, uh, wish to see Jesus. Greeks were not, in this context, referring to Jews, they were Gentiles. And by the way, brothers and sisters, are you still with me this morning? We are the Gentiles, unless we are Jewish today. So one thing that makes the Pharisees anxious is they know (laughs) that if they continue to let this man, from their perspective, carry on the way he's carrying on, he's going to draw a following from non-Jewish people. Second reason why I think this is right. If you read Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, John in Revelation says a similar thing by using different words. He doesn't use the term world in John chapter 5 or in Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, but he uses the language of tongues and tribes and peoples and nations, essentially to say the same thing in multiple ways that he could have said by using the term world. So Revelation 5, verses 9 and 10, hear the word of God. John says, with respect to Jesus, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Brothers and sisters, God loves the world to the point that he gave his son to die for some from every tongue and tribe and people 
and nations. Second point, everyone who believes in the Son receives eternal life. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. Now, an important clarification is necessary here. Not everyone will believe in the Son. John is not promising in verse 16 that God gave his Son to the world and therefore everyone in the world will believe. And therefore everyone in the world will receive eternal life. John is making the promise that God gave his Son to the world so that anyone who believes in the Son would receive eternal life. When he talks about believing in the Son, it's an important word there. He doesn't mean simply acknowledging theological truths about the Son. The demons and the devil acknowledge truths about God. James says the demons believe that God is one and they tremble. We see from the Gospels that even the demons know that Jesus is the Son of God, but they don't have eternal life. When John talks about believing, he's talking about faith. And for the Gospel of John, faith, I think, is, in in an entire Bible in my view, that faith can be summarized as believing everything that God has said about his son Jesus and committing your lives to that until you die or until Jesus returns, whichever comes first, so that you will receive eternal life. And that eternal life is yes, deliverance from judgment and wrath, but it's also a life that results in the transformational power of the Spirit according to the Gospel of John as rivers of life are overflowing within those who believe. And and that eternal life is something that we have inherited right now by faith in part, and we are awaiting that future reality when Jesus returns. But brothers and sisters, hear this carefully. If you believe in the Son right now, you already have eternal life. Amen? By faith. So an important foundation to redemptive kingdom diversity is this fact that God has acted in Jesus to restore everything that Adam and Eve lost in the garden when they sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned, the entire creation, humans' relationships with God, humans' relationships with each other, and the relationships of humans with the creation, and the creation itself, all of the above, were destroyed, devastated, corrupted because of sin. But God has acted in Christ to bring about his rescue plan of redemption. Romans 18, uh, 8, verses 18 through 25, by way of summary, it basically says this point, that God subjected creation in futility with the hope that he would redeem it, the certainty that he would redeem it, and that the entire creation is awaiting for that future redemption that is yet to come of the entire creation. As we who have been redeemed right now We are awaiting our future resurrection bodies. And so the creation is also crying out, longing for its redemption, which it has only in the Lord Jesus Christ. So brothers and sisters, God loves the world. He loves every tongue and tribe and people and nation. And he gave his son so that that some from every tongue and tribe and people and nation would believe in the Son, commit their lives to the Son, follow the Son until the end. Two applications of this truth. First, may we therefore, the ethnically diverse people of God, love one another with the same kind of selfless, sacrificial love that Christ has for every tongue and tribe and people nation. Just read this afternoon sometime John chapters 13 through 17. 
as Jesus is laying out for his disciples in John 13, what he is going to do for them in Jerusalem on the cross, he washes their feet to illustrate that he is going to become the suffering servant from Isaiah 53 for them and for the nations. And he gives them an example to imitate. That example is to serve one another in love. And he gives them a series of exhortations about the Spirit in chapter 14 and 15, as well as about loving one another. And one thing Jesus says to his Jewish disciples who are going to take the gospel to non-Jewish people after the resurrection He says, the world will know that you love me, not by how many theological degrees you have after your name. It's not what he says. I'm all for theological degrees. I teach at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, right? Every word matters. The Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I am all in on theological education, but brothers and sisters, there are people with many theological degrees who do not love Jesus. And you know they don't love Jesus by how they live their lives as well as by what they believe. Jesus instead tells his disciples before he dies, this is how you show the world that you love me, that you're committed to me and my gospel by loving one another. And of course, we all fall short. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Lord knows I have a million times over No one has loved their neighbors to the degree that God demands or expects. But nevertheless, the expectation is because Jesus loves the nations, so must we also love every tongue and tribe and people and nation. And love does not mean we always agree. It doesn't mean we go along to get along. One of the most loving things we do is tell people the truth when they are in error, right? We can love even as we confront and disagree, but love means that we have a vision for God's redemptive plan and what that vision should look like as we live with real people on the ground who may or may not look like us in the real world. Second application, may we therefore love our neighbors as our ourselves, as well as loving one another. In my view, what John is outlining in summary form in John 3, 16, for God's vision for redemptive kingdom diversity does not mean that you only love those who look like you or sound like you or think like you. That's fairly easy. But the gospel compels us to love even when it's difficult to love. Love is messy, isn't it? Isn't it? It's hard. If you love someone, you inevitably at some point in your life, you are brought to joy or to tears because of that love. And the kind of love that Jesus has for us, tuck him to the cross. And the kind of love he compels us to have for each other as the people of God and for our neighbors is the kind of love that is selfless and sacrificial. Yes, wise. Yes, using common sense as we love. Not being foolish or naive, but loving in a way that's consistent with the gospel and the spirit-empowered transformation that God in Christ has accomplished. So in my view, redemptive kingdom diversity does not ignore, deny, or obsess over ethnic identity, nor does it emphasize ethnic identity as transcendent over our human identity and over our new identities in Christ. But it also acknowledges that in Christ Jesus, we are newly created humans. Our ethnic identities are transformed but not erased in Christ. However, redemptive kingdom diversity moves us to choose to show selfless, sacrificial love for diverse, ethnically speaking, humans created in the image of God, regardless of ethnic difference. 
We neither should obsess over ethnic difference nor look at ethnic difference with hate. Certainly, we evaluate people based on the content of their character and not on the color of their skin. However, we are not blind to the reality that God has beautifully created humans in many different shades and tongues and tribes and peoples and nations, and He has created, recreated in Christ many from different tongues and tribes and peoples and nations into a transformed people because He sent His Son to give us eternal life. This does not mean, however, that every church should be, can be, or will be multi-ethnic. That's not the point. But it does mean God's redemption of the world in Christ teaches that we are heading toward the new Jerusalem. We're heading toward the new world where the kingdom of God will be filled with all the ethnic diversity that God has redeemed. And that future kingdom that we await has broken in right now in part by the indwelling presence and power of the Spirit as the ethnically diverse people of God are loving one another and their neighbors as themselves in the power of the Spirit. There's not a one-size-fits-all way to apply this. We should apply it in ways consistent with their context and our capacity. But we should apply these truths with lament, with patience, with joy, with wisdom, with forgiveness, with love, with common sense, with creativity, and with a robust vision that's grounded in God's saving action in Christ and the cross and the resurrection and in a way that honors our Trinitarian God. A way that brings glory to his holistic redemption. So brothers and sisters, God loves the world. May we therefore love one another and love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would help us to love your vision for the world and help us to love one another in the power of the Spirit and to love our neighbors as ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen.